Every nigga says, I have. I have. When I hide it in my heart, and let it be formed in my mouth. When I speak it in faith, it unleashes the creative power of God that causes me to walk in victory, success, deliverance, healing, and prosperity. Come on, give him a big shout of praise. You may be seated. We should have had that testimony before he took the offering, but it's not too late for you. Um, but I, I'm being silly for a minute. In all realness, if we can teach our children to tithe at a young age, to give to the Lord that way, it's a principle in the Bible that yields his blessing every time. And this, this man at eight years old, made a decision for two things. Number one, he would tithe. Number two, he would take care of God's people. And he's dedicated his life. He's 94 years old, and he's dedicated his life to that. And God has poured millions and millions of dollars in his hands. What a God we serve. Can I get an amen? Amen. And can, I, can I say this to you? Um, don't take this wrong. Tithing should not take faith. We should... In faith, tithe, but it shouldn't take faith. What do I mean by that is, if our life is built around giving to God, then it shouldn't be, oh God, it's not there. I'm just going to give in faith. Do you hear me? Yeah. If our life is centered around giving, and what I mean by that is, please forgive me, this is just a little fathering type stuff I'm going to say, especially to the young people. Some of us older ones, we've made some big mistakes and we've got to fix those. Some of the younger ones, listen to me close. If you would budget your life around giving to God, then everything you buy or do would be God first and His is not touched. What I mean by that is if maybe you're you look at a new car and you know you get that fever when you smell the leather inside of it, you you look at that one, but then they say there's one right there for five more thousand that has the power windows and the heated seats. And, and you're getting ready to just, oh my goodness, this is, I can't. I, I, they told me some guy yesterday had a thousand dollar note on his pickup truck. What? A thousand dollars, a nice truck for a thousand dollars a month. But I'm going to say this, if my life is centered around giving to God, it's not how much I have the fever to buy the vehicle as much as it's God. What can I afford above you? And what I'm giving to you. Does that make sense to anybody? And I believe the Jewish people, and some of you younger ones don't know this, but the older ones will. They used to talk about Jewish people when I was a kid, not in a derogatory way, but in a way that those guys always have money. But they were taught from the foundation you give to God. That's, that's bred into them. So if they buy a home or they buy anything, it's always after they make sure God has his money first. It's just the way it works. In, in, in the United States, we don't quite have it that way, but I'm telling you, we need to, to get that in. And I want to give praise to the Lord, and this may not be much to you, but it, but it is to me. I was so overwhelmed this week. I was, uh, for those that don't know, I also work. I don't just pastor, but I, I have a, a job and and uh, so I'm out in front of a house, and I'm working on this house, and, and uh, it's, it's my house, and I'm trying to do some work on it. And I said, God, um, I need some trim for this area in the back. And I'm running around frantically because I don't want to spend any money on the trim. And this may seem very small to you. But I said, God, I, I need trim for this house. And he reminded me, just look on the porch. The piece you just cut off of the big piece is your trim board. In other words, I wanted a board that was a 2 by 10 They didn't have it. So they sold me a 2 by 12 Or a 1 by 10 and a 1 by 12 But what that means is 1 inch by, by 12 inches. But that was too big, so I had to cut a section off because they didn't have what I really wanted. But the section I cut off was what I needed for the back of the house. Also, the same time when I went to the store, I bought a one by eight. I only needed seven and a half feet. So I said, please give me an eight foot piece. We don't sell it in eight foot. 
you have to buy 16 feet. I said, I don't want to buy 16 feet. I'm going to waste 8 feet of that. I just want an 8 foot piece. Sorry, you got to buy the whole thing. So I bought the whole thing. And I brought it to the house. And I'm looking up, and I, I got this trim lined up, and I look and I said, oh man, I forgot that whole board right there. I need a one by eight piece of trim. And the guy looks at me, and I look at the back of my truck, and I said, there it is right there. Because they made me buy an extra eight feet. Now you can say, well, Brother Dave, that's, that's coincidence. Well, you can call what you want, but I've done it now for 25 or 30 years. Because I mess up on orders or I make mistakes on what I buy. I mess up all kinds of stuff and my mistake is what I really need. How would you like to live in that atmosphere? Yeah. I mean, an order comes in and I'm getting upset. I, I learned how don't get upset because it's probably what you want because God has got your back. Yeah. I've lived with the mindset. No, let me rephrase it. I've lived with the reality that he's got my back. And so I learned how to rest in that place. But sometimes we get to the position where we don't believe it or we get all frustrated and bent out of shape and it takes a couple of minutes for us to regain our consciousness, our spiritual consciousness. But the facts are God is trying to take care of us. That's why there's teachings on tithing and all sorts of other things. God is faithful. Can I tell you one more story? I was in Bay St. Louis working. It was like uh, 5 in the morning. I won't tell you, at a Sears building that the police kicked in the back door with a guns drawn. That was scary, but we won't go there. But anyway, I'm working inside this building in the middle of the night. The police didn't know I was there. That's why they came in. I thought I was robbing the place. But, but I was building something for uh, the, the owners of, or the, the, the managers for Sears. And so I'm working in the back, and I get all this material, and I load it up, and I get so frustrated because I see it. I said, man... Why do people keep sending me the wrong stuff? This is about 20 some years ago. And then when I had got to the end of the process of building and realized I needed some other kind of wood for another area that I totally forgot about, I just went to the pile that God ordered and got the wood that I needed for the other project. Do you understand? He has got your back. He's in front of us. He's not behind us. He's all the way around us. He knows us. And oh, by the way, young people, let me just warn you. Big warning. Tell someone next to you, young people, say, big warning from Pastor Dave. Now, I do this for the adults, too, but young people, I want you to know, because, see, when I start praying for my grandchildren, they're all fairly young, except the ones that are getting old now, so they've changed everything. I'm sorry, guys. But 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 and, and but you guys are in the list as well. And so here's for my grandchildren. You guys and then you other young people are added to this. I pray for you every morning. God, let the angels be before them, behind them, beside them, underneath them, cover them. And then you and young people are praying for all of you young people. And then also I pray put a thorny hedge of protection around their mind so they can't get influenced by anything else. Oh, you guys are in trouble <laughs> in a good way. He honors our prayers. I don't pray to a dead God. I don't have a plastic Jesus. Come on now. I have a relationship with a living God that says you're my son, and I have ears to hear what you have to say. Yeah. The fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I'll tell you, that's a good scripture. But it just kind of makes it seem like, wow, if you're righteous and you're out there, God will answer you. It's more than him answering my prayer. It's that God sees my every need, my every wound, my every hurt. As Isabella said, every feeling that I have, he's right there beside me. And he carries me. It's so exciting to realize I'm not doing this alone. I'm not in a battle zone. I don't have to figure it out. I just got to trust him in the midst of it. He does it. Oh, I'll just tell you. Sister Tammy, I'm just going to tell her if it's all right, baby. She's rolling her eyes. Oh, my goodness. The house I was working on was mine. I've never had a second house in my life. Okay, but the Bible does say that those that are his will have houses. It's plural. It doesn't say one. It doesn't limit me. You're not limited to one house. Did you know that? That's the Bible. It's biblical. So I was at home praying one day, and I said, God, I need about $16,000, like right now. So I said, I need 16000 
Then I changed it. I went up on him on it. But anyway, I told him, I said, I need $16,000. That's the bare minimum. I need someone to give me $16,000 cash. So it wasn't like two or three days later, one of the men that I know in the church, I ran into him. And he said, man, I'm cutting the grass on some old house over there. And I said, okay. He said, they want $28,000 for it. I said, who yeah. So I called him up and I said, uh, you want 28000 for that house? I said, yeah. I said, can you come down? No. Okay. So I told my wife, I said, you know, it would be a good idea to get a house and fix it up and sell it. Amen? I mean, hey, they do it on TV all the time. I'm thinking, they put the house, I put the house, we all put the house, we're all happy. <laughs> so my wife and I were praying and I said, look, baby, I said, I looked at the house. I said, you know, we, we don't, we can't get this house. It's got to be about 15000 True story. This is Got to be about fifteen thousand. She says, um, "Okay, I agree. Fifteen thousand, no more. Okay." My wife is so giving to me, you know. She's got she some flexibility in there. So anyway, I called him up. I said, "Would you come down?" No, I won't come down. It's okay. Finally, I, I talked to him again. Somehow, they said we'll come down to twenty-five. I said, mm, "Twenty-five is not going to work." And so, you know, I'm praying about it, and I look at the house, and and. Uh, I don't know if they called me or I called them, but uh, they called me and said, look. No, I called them up and I said, look, you know, where are you at? I, I think they said 18,000. And so when they said 18,000, I really got interest because 18 is only three from 15. <laughs> <laughs> hey, God, I mean, I limited it to 15, but I have faith to believe, you know, or faith to not believe you can do 15. Maybe I have faith to, my faith was my words were for 15 when my faith started, but my real faith is we can do it at 18. Yeah, that makes sense. Anybody know what I'm talking yeah. about? Because we do that. You know, we don't really stand on what we say. <laughs> Forgive us, Jesus. Forgive me. I'm confessing my sin. So anyway, I, I talked to my wife, and such a good lady. She says to me, well, 18 is, is fine. So I called him up. I said, I called the bank first, and I called him up. I said, look, I'll take it for 18. Well, Brother Dave, uh, Donna and I talked about it. We got a good deal on our house in Pennsylvania, so we want you to have it for 15. <laughs> what? Tell me how cool our God is. And so my house is almost done. Everyone, if, if you trust me, pray this with me. Just hold your hand up before the Lord. If you trust me, say this with me. Jesus, Jesus. sell Brother Dave's house Jesus. for a whole lot more. Than he expects. In Jesus' name. I'm excited about that. Thank you. By the end of next week, I put it up for sale. So we're going to believe God for a miraculous sale on this little house. And isn't that cool how God does stuff like that, though? I said 15. He says, okay, I heard you 15. Then I said, well, I'll do 18. God is not a negotiator like that. He says, if faith said, let's do it, then let's do it and do it the right way. What a God. Looking for a house for 19. Amen. There we go. He's looking for one for 19. He wants one for 20. It's all over the room. Open your Bible, if you would, to the book of Judges, chapter 6. This is no revelation. This is no new message, no new, new teaching. This is, hopefully, if you read your Bible, this is something that has uh, you heard preached a thousand times over. But I felt in my heart this morning that God was saying for me to preach it or share it again, so I will. The book of Judges, chapter 6. Judges, chapter 6, starting with verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hands of Midian for seven years. Now, I'm going to stop right there. Because if the Lord delivered me into the hands of my enemy for one minute, I want to get on my face and repent and make it right. Does anybody hear me? Yes. But sometimes we just put up with our own shenanigans. We put up with, well, it might not be so bad. I'm going to tell you, when God says, I'm going to let the enemy do a little number on you, it's bad. And I won't go into the United States of America and say that chapter 6 and 7 is, could be the United States of America. And I won't tell you that if it's the United States of America that Gideon would represent the church and that we can repent and come and do great things. I won't go into all that because that's a second message, but you can figure that out for yourself. Because our nation has been in a mess 
And judgment has come in many ways. And we've had terrible things happen that never happened before. And I'm convinced because we backed away from the very presence of God and allowed the enemy to have his way. And when the enemy has his way, God is a jealous God. And he says, I'm going to get your attention, folks. Amen. Different message. I'm talking about Gideon. Seven years. This was not new, no new battle. It was a call for deliverance. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, verse 2. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made themselves dens in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel would sow, they plant their food, that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till they would come to Gaza. And they left no substance for Israel neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. For they came up with their cattle and their tents. They came as many as like grasshoppers for the multitude. For both they and their camels were without number. And they entered into the land to destroy it. Listen to me close. When a nation, when a people open a door for the enemy to come in. When a family opens a door for the enemy to come in. He won't come in one at a time. When he starts coming in, he will come in with enough to inhabit the land. I hope you're hearing me. Be it our family, or be it our nation, be it our city, or be it whatever, the enemy will come in if given the doorway, and he will be like the sand of the seashore trying to take over. Are you hearing me? And Israel, verse 6, was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Isn't it something that it took them seven years to cry unto the Lord? Seven years. Church, keep that in mind. When the enemy knocks, when the enemy starts coming in, don't wait. Immediately get a hold of God and say, God, what door was left open? Or what situation happened? Come God, on now. I've got to find your strength in the midst of this. If it's something, Lord, you want me to walk through, I'll walk through. But if it's a doorway I've opened up, God, help me to shut that door. Come on. Amen. Sometimes we've got to do some self-examination to figure out what in the world is going on. Because if we allow it to continue, we'll be like the guy for 38 years by the pool of Bethesda and just living that way with no hope until Jesus finally showed up. Well, I've got news for you. Jesus already showed up and he's ready to deliver and heal and set you free. Amen? Amen. Amen. So when the enemy starts warring, don't wait too long. Don't tolerate too much. Just get a hold of God and say, God, let's make a way where there is no way. I trust you in the midst of it. Children of Israel said to them, thus says the Lord God, I brought you up out of Egypt. And basically he goes on to say, you guys turned your back on me, but guess what? I still love you. What an awesome God. No matter what we seem to do, if we cry out to him, he is there to say, I love you and I'll be there for you. These are just some good tidbits in the midst of it. Verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash and his son Gideon, threshing wheat by the winepress to hide from the Midianites. So, so we have a guy named Gideon, a young man, and he's threshing wheat in the winepress. He wasn't in the open field. He was hiding for his life because of the Midianites. He's scared to death. Is everybody with me? How many has ever been scared when the, when, when the attack is coming? I mean, every one of us. Listen, verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said, The Lord is with thee, O mighty man of valor. Now I've preached this a thousand times over, but I'm going to preach it again. The Lord is with thee, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if you're with us, why is all this upon us? And where are the miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of Midian. And you know, the angel does not even respond to this negativity, if you continue to read. Don't expect God to respond sometimes to your negativity. He's just trying to get you to what you need to be and where you need to be. God sees you different than you see you. Well, there's two. Amen. Three, four. 
But God sees you different than you see you. We look in the mirror or we examine ourselves and we have either too high of a picture of who we think we are, we're a legend in our own mind, or we're too low and feel like we're nothing and we, we are valueless. I'm going to tell you somewhere in the middle of that, God says, I see you as a mighty woman of valor or a mighty man of valor. You are not a failure. You're loved. I am your father. I will strengthen you. I'll carry you through. He sees you as a victorious warrior in every direction of your life. Yes, Lord. That's who you are. Woo. Brother Dave, I don't feel like Thank it. You, Lord. Neither did Gideon. Gideon didn't feel like he was anything. Go to the next verse and see what he says. Oh, my Lord, if you're with us, why has all this come? Verse 14. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this your might, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, Oh, my Lord, how shall I save Israel? Listen to me close. How will you allow me to be a leader or to save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. I'm nothing. I am nothing. My family has nothing. I have no authority, no power. God says, that's because you're worried about your flesh and who you seem to be in the natural. But let me get a hold of you. Let my spirit be inside of you and I will make you more than a conqueror. I'll rise you up. You'll be a man, a woman of authority and power. Allow me inside. Don't look as you see yourself, but look as I see you, almighty man of valor. That's what he was saying. You are somebody in Christ Jesus. Amen. Verse 16, the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you will smite the Midianites as one man. So he goes through a whole system with God, and God is so gracious to bring him to that place and to cause him to become a man ready to go to war. So Gideon has about 32,000 men, and he's getting ready to go to war against the Midianites. And I've said this a thousand times again, because I've been preaching a long time. It's easy to feel comfortable, even if you have a smaller group, to get in the middle of 32,000 people and say, let's go do this thing, guys. But God is not worried about numbers. He's worried about faithfulness. God is not worried about your stature. He's worried about faithfulness. God is not worried about how much money you have. He's worried about your faithfulness. God is not worried about your capability or how smart you are Come or how on. educated you are, how pretty you are, how ugly you are, how short, how tall, how whatever you are. He's worried about your faithfulness. And in your faithfulness, if you say, God, I'm available, I want to be that which you want me to be, God is going to do something great through you and he'll catapult you right through life. Yes, yes. Lord. For some of you that say, well, Brother Dave, I don't know that I'll ever do anything great. If you have spiritual children and you are a mentor to them, you're doing something great right now. Amen. If you have physical children, God has given you the greatest blessing on planet Earth that you can leave a legacy when you're dead and gone and you're in the heavens with the Lord and you're able to be there and enjoy the throne room of God. You can look down and say, God, but I left a legacy and the legacy is the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of His Word and the power of His Come Spirit. On, and my children will carry on in the same thing that I carried and I've gone. They will push through because I trained them and taught them about you. Yes, Lord. You win. You don't have to lead an army of 32,000. All you have to do is lead your family into the kingdom of God, and you've done a great thing before the Lord. Yes. My mother got saved 50-some years ago. She said, God, my whole family will serve you. Proud to announce her whole family is serving the Lord. Some a little closer, some not so close. But we're all serving the Lord. And our grandchildren and grandchildren and her great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren are being taught about the power of Jesus Christ and His Word. You'll never leave a greater legacy than when you take a young one and you impart into them the Word of God. When you take a baby in the Lord and impart the Word of God. When you say you can do it, you are somebody through Christ Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord. He took some fishermen, tax collectors, people that were not the best of the best, kind of like David's mighty men, 600 derelicts, 600 that nobody wanted. But David became the greatest king and they become the greatest leaders Israel ever had because of faithful hearts that would lay down their life for their leader. Jesus chose a few men that weren't the best of the best. But you and I in every church in the nations of the world preach about those same people constantly because he took them up from being a nothing to something mighty. Listen to me. You are somebody. Amen. I said this the other day. I'm repeating myself. But when you wake up in the morning, <laughs> two areas are taking notice. Heaven is noticing and hell is noticing. Don't you think hell doesn't know your name? Don't you think every demon force around your area does not know your name? Don't you think the devil doesn't know your name? The question is, what do they know about you? Do they know that you look in the mirror, that you, you get frustrated, that you don't like who you are? Do they know that you feel like you're a failure and you're not that good of a Christian? Or do they know that you are washed in the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ and you're walking in the power of the resurrection and the same spirit Come that raised now. Christ from the dead is alive in you? Do they know that you will not take his shenanigans, that you will stand up in the word of God and say, Devil, you are under my feet and I live in this battle and this victory. Amen. Does heaven rejoice when you get up? Because heaven says, watch, watch, watch. They're going to share my name. Don't slow down, church. Don't back off. Chapter 7. Gideon and all the people that were with him, 32,000, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod so uh, that the host of Midian was on the north side of them by the hill of Moriah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, listen to me close, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites in your hands. You ever thought about that? The people are too many. There's too much for you in this situation. I've got to make it more difficult. Did you ever think about it like that? It's too easy. It's too easy the way it is. I've got to make it more difficult. The people are too many with you to give the Midianites in your hand, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand to save me. Now therefore go and proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there return to the people. This is a bad day for the preacher, by the way. This is a terrible day for the leader of the 32,000. This is a bad day for Gideon. What he says, God says, those of you that are afraid get to go home. And 22,000 of the 32,000 walk down the road. I'm going to tell you, Gideon was probably looking about like this saying, really? Oh my God. Help us. 22,000 people left. They only had 32,000. When you're at 32,000, it's not so bad. But when 22 of them say, well, I am afraid. I'm going home. You're stuck with 10,000 people. It'll make you check your faith. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. I said, no, they're not, God. I promise you, I know they're not too many. The Lord said, I'm not even, just bring them down to the water and I will try them there. And it'll be that of whom I say to you, this shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say, these shall not go, they shall not go. So he brought them down, the people, to the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that laps of the water with his tongue, like a dog would lap, him you will set by himself. Likewise, everyone else that bows down upon his knees and drinks. And the number of them that laughed, putting their hands in their mouth, 
with 300 men. Now, right there, I would have said, oh, God, no. No, God, I know what you're doing. No, 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 no. Not the 300. I'll take the 9,700. You take the 300. But because I know the ways of God a little bit, I know what God's going to do. So I'm sure Gideon was saying, oh, man, I wish it was 50-50. This stinks. I know what he's going to do. I know what he's going to do. I know what he's going to do. He just did it. I know what he's going to do. And the number of them that lapped putting their hand to their mouth were 300. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, By 300 men that have lapped, will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thy hand, and let all the other people go to his own place. 32,000, 22,000 leave. Now 9,700. Me and my 300 don't look very big. Not at all. So the people, the 300, took their middles in their hand and uh, their trumpets, and he sent them, all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent. Verse 9, and it came to pass at the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, get thee down to the host. Long story short, you find that Gideon goes down into the camp. There's a dream. He knows, man, God is on my side. He was strengthened. I mean, I would have to get strengthened. The Lord said to me, hey, Gideon, he started out with 32,000, then 22,000 left. Now 9,700 left. You got 300 left. Do you think you're afraid, son? Because if you are, I got something for you. Yes, I'm afraid. I'm scared to death. <laughs> so he sneaks down to camp and hears them talking. God gave a dream. To someone in the camp, but I don't know if it was just one or the whole camp, but they begin to have an understanding that God is going to use some guy named Gideon to destroy us. Don't you know for a second? Don't forget it. God is ahead of us in the battle and in the circumstance and in the situation. He knows everything way ahead of the journey. He made provisions for Gideon, number one, to get rid of his fear, but number two, to scare those guys slap to death. <laughs> so that's what happened. Gideon comes back up and says, hey guys, I feel pretty good about myself. We can do this. Breaks him up into the companies of 300 and they all get around the camp and he says, when I tell you, I want you to scream the sword of the Lord in Gideon and I want you to break the lamps and make a great shout and blow the trumpets. These guys are down there. Now we're not 300 together. We're 100 apart, but we have faith. And so the next thing you know, Gideon starts. He breaks the lantern. The light comes up. Everyone around him, the 100 break their lantern. They begin to shout and blow their horns. And then on the other side, it happens. And on the other side, it happens. And when the, the Midianites wake up and hear the sound and see all the lanterns, and the fire around them realizing we're under a massive attack by thousands and thousands and thousands of Israelites. They begin to kill their shells and they begin to just draw the sword at each other and they went crazy in the camp and the rest of them started running and Israel chased them down. Now they had the big army and they finished them off. What a powerful victory Gideon had. Question. I'm going to wrap it up here very shortly. What kind of a Christian are you? A lapper or a layer? Are you a lapper or are you a layer? Because I'm going to tell you what's happened to the church. Many Christians have laid in the glory move of God. Many Christians have laid in the very presence of God and their life is centered around. I just want him to touch me. I just want him to overshadow me. I just want to drink of his presence. I just want to be in his glory. And we walk out of the church and, and we're kind of like in our ballet costume. Forgive me for mocking you. We're going, ooh, we got the little spiritual tutu on. And we're saying, oh my, God is so good. And he is. But we're lappers. We're laying faith. 
face down with our face in the water, just lapping it up, sucking it up. Or excuse me, we're not lappers, we're layers. We've got our face down in the water, laying before it and drinking all that we can. Drink, drink some more. We even wrote songs about it. Drink, drink, and there's nothing wrong with the songs. But the church, by and large, has become layers instead of lappers. You see, the lapper went to the water. The layers laid down. And if you look the word God on the knees, it means they laid flat on the ground. So 9,700 men laid flat on the ground with their face just laying in the water, just sloshing it up. And I said, God, that reminds me of the church in many ways. And don't misunderstand me. Oh, I want to slosh around in his presence. I want to lay in his glory. I want him to just overshadow me. It is good. Can I get an amen? amen? But I'll tell you, I better lay in his glory but be a lapper instead of a layer. Because here's the lapper. Going down to the water, pulling it up, and drinking it. You see, the lapper was doing what Jesus said to the disciples when he was in that place of prayer. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The layer is just always laying. Cover me with your glory, God. I just want to feel your goodness. They go home and they call each other. Oh, how good he is. Oh, it's wonderful. And then we go do it again. And then we go do it again. And we go do it again. Oh, my. Man, I fell out 17 times the other night. It was wonderful. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. And it is good to be in his presence. Don't misunderstand me. You're looking at a man that loves to just waller in the very presence of God. But we must have eyes to see. We must be alert as soldiers on the army of God saying, Lord, no matter how much I feel your presence, I won't go to sleep and pretend like there's no enemy out there, but I'll look around as the watchman on the wall. I'll be like you called the disciples to be, to watch and pray, to watch and enjoy, to watch and enjoy your presence. I don't want to be a layer. I want to be a lapper. I want to be one that says, God, cover me, fill me, Thrill me. There's no greater feeling if you've never been there. If you've never been in his presence that way. I remember one time in the old building was about right back there about where Sister Shirley is and Sister Tammy. Remember, I fell up against the wall just like someone threw me up against the wall. I am. I'm just sitting there and I'm weeping from head to toe. I mean, just my whole body is just shaking. And then as I go down the wall, it changed from weeping to laughter and to joy. I'm thinking, God, this is crazy stuff. I mean, when you laugh so much, you can't stop it. You say, God, I feel so good. And your tears are tears, not of sorrow, but of thanksgiving and joy. How many ever watched a video or saw something happen and a joy tear came out? Anybody? How about a flood of joy tears? Where in, you just flooded so much you can't even stop them. But it's not because you're sad. It's because you're so happy. One time I was so happy in the Lord. He kept this pouring it over me. I'm crying. I'm weeping. I'm, oh my God, you feel so good. I said, Lord, stop. I don't want no more. Give something to my brother over in Arizona. Literally, that was a prayer. I couldn't take it anymore. It was so good. I love to be in his presence. I know some of you are going to think I'm crazy with this, and it's all right. Because I may be. I said this a thousand times before. I lost my mind a long time ago. I didn't want it back. But I'm in the building and they're praying by myself one day. Sister Mary, you're going to get a kick out of this. I know. I just know you enough to say she's going to love this. I'm just, I'm just in, in the presence of the Lord. And I said, oh, God, I love you so much. So I just reached over and laid hands on myself. <laughs> Bam! I went out in the spirit. I fell on the floor. Nobody's there to catch me. Nobody's around. I laid there on the ground. I said, man, this is weird. <laughs> Who lays their hand on their own floor? It'll fall down. It's crazy. So I got up, and I'm worshiping, and I did it again. Bam! I fell out. I said, God, this is nuts. I did it a third time. I said, God, if someone looked in this room, they'd think I was absolutely psychotic. But his presence was so around me, I tried it again. Bam! Preaching a fifth time, I said, bam, I'm on the ground. I said, after that, I'm not doing it no more. This is crazy, God. <laughs> this is lunatic stuff. This is psychotic. 
No, this is his love that he was so around me. I couldn't handle it. I have been in his presence. I wanted to tell you, I would love every day to just roll around in his glory and enjoy him overshadowing me. But I cannot lay in the presence of his spirit. Some people are laying in the word, the washing of the word, the water of the word. They're just laying in it and just Godly, to, oh, let me, Lord, some more. And God is saying, there's plenty, but get up and watch. Come on, let me. Get up and watch. Because I didn't call you just to walk in my glory. There's a place called a New Jerusalem. We call it heaven and then heaven descending. Whatever you want to label it as. We're going to forever be with him one day. And guess what? You can just... Waller in his, I don't know why I'm saying the word Waller. My wife will get on me later on. You can just get in his glory and roll around all day long and just, oh my, and it'll never stop. And you don't have to worry about battling. You don't have to worry about the devil. You don't have to worry about, just enjoy his presence all the time. But right now, enjoy the glory, but watch. But watch. Watch and pray. That you have to know to provision. Watch. Because the enemy, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. There's a real enemy out there. And I'm going to say this. You want to go against the devil? I'd rather go against him after I've been rolling in the glory. A whole lot more than any other time in my life. I mean, when you roll in the glory of God, you come out, you smell like Jesus, you look like Jesus, you act like Jesus, you walk like Jesus, you got a faith around you like Jesus. There's something about Jesus in you. I think it was uh, uh, the funny preacher, what's his name in New Orleans? Jesse Duplantis or one of them was saying that, that the guys are going to eat or something. I, I may have the story mixed up if I do just, just go along and pretend like it's right. But he was with the guys and, and uh, uh, they were out eating the ministers and they were going to go out to eat or something and the Lord said, I want you to go pray. And he went up to his motel room and he rolled in the glory, basically. He stayed in the presence of God. Listen to me, there's something about the presence of God. When he got to the church that night to speak, he was late. <coughs> And when he walked in the door, every eye was on him. And as he walked around the corner, see, the people recognize the glory of the Lord. The devil recognizes the glory of the Lord. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Roll in the glory, but keep a watchful eye. And realize God has called you to be one covered in his glory, but to walk as a warrior of great victory and authority and power. Drink the word. Drink the word. Drink the word. As Susan and then went over there, let him hug you. Let him embrace you. Let him cover you. And then get up and watch. See, if God hugs me, all that should tell me is I am God's child. Devil, get out of my way. And that can't just be some empty words that we're trying to say. Devil, I rebuke you. I'm telling you, somewhere you've got to have enough faith to believe what you're saying is what you're saying. And walk on through him. Many people have been in delivered services and people screaming and yelling and speaking in tongues and going crazy, commanding and binding and loosening, and voices are shouting out the other person, and they're kicking and screaming and won't do anything. And then one person might walk over and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, it's done. Amen. And bam. My brother-in-law said one time, you, you, you can say what you want on this, but when we are ambassadors of God and God tells us what to say, then we can walk and say, guess what? I'm a shadow of my daddy. They're trying to cast devils out of, of someone one time, and I think the story kind of went like this. I mean, they're having a, a time with this demonic possessed people person. They're, they're holding them down, they're praying, and he walks over and says, don't you know who this is? This is God. Get out. That's over. Why? Because the authority and the power and the glory of the Lord was about him. It wasn't about just laying in it and not becoming strong by the word of God. It was one that would say, I'll drink up and I'll drink up and I'll drink up. I'll drink the word of God. I'll drink his presence. I'll be saturated in him. But I will stand as a watchman with power and authority. Listen to me, O oh man of God. You're called to watch over your home. Oh. 
I'll be done in nine minutes, I promise. Man of God. You say, well, I'm not that strong of a Christian. It's my wife's job. No, it's not. It's your job, man of God. Rise up. Take authority over your home. Be the watchman on the wall. Be the covering of that house the way God designed you to be. And when you do your part, guess what? God will launch your wife into her part in a greater, stronger way. She seems to have to sometimes fight the battle alone. Listen to me. It's not your wife's battle to fight for the family on her knees just because she might be an intercessor or a prayer warrior. Oh, man of God, it is on your shoulders by the word of God that you're to cover and pray with her. Yes. Stand in authority. Rise in authority. Stand with your wife. Stand to believe. Take authority. The enemy comes into some of our homes. He's beating things to pieces. I'm going to tell you, oh, I didn't mean to get on this, but it's a nice little soapbox for a minute. Let's just stay there. Seven minutes left. Okay. We're fearful for what's going on in our families, our finances, our circumstances, our world. But when a man and a woman will determine in their heart, we will pray together. We'll be as one voice. We'll unite as a team, as one, as a family. We're going to cry out to our God and declare over our family. I'm going to tell you there's something about the power of unity that is unshakable, unmovable. When you guys pray together, hell cannot stand because you have stepped into that which God has ordained. And if God has ordained it, the enemy can't stand against it. Question. I'm going to wrap it up here very shortly. What kind of a Christian are you? A lapper or a layer? Are you a lapper or are you a layer? Because I'm going to tell you what's happened to the church. Many Christians have laid in the glory move of God. Many Christians have laid in the very presence of God and their life is centered around. I just want him to touch me. I just want him to overshadow me. I just want to drink from his presence. I just want to be in his glory. And we walk out of the church and, and we're kind of like in our ballet costume. Forgive me for mocking. And we're going, Ooh, we got the little spiritual tutu on. And we're saying, oh my, God is so good. And he is. Amen. But we're lappers. We're laying face down with our face in the water, just lapping it up, sucking it up. We're, excuse me, we're not lappers, we're layers. We've got our face down in the water, laying before it and drinking all that we can. Drink, drink some more. We even wrote songs about it. Drink, drink, and there's nothing wrong with the songs. But the church, by and large, has become layers instead of lappers. You see, the lapper went to the water. The layers laid down. And if you look the word God on the knees, it means they laid flat on the ground. So 9,700 men laid flat on the ground with their face just laying in the water, just sloshing it up. And I said, God, that reminds me of the church in many ways. And don't misunderstand me. Oh, I want to slosh around in his presence. I want to lay in his glory. I want him to just overshadow me. It is good. Can I get an amen? Yeah. But I'll tell you, I better lay in his glory but be a lapper instead of a layer. Because here's the lapper. Going down to the water, pulling it up, and drinking it. You see, the lapper was doing what Jesus said to the disciples when he was in that place of prayer, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The layers just always lay. Cover me with your glory, God. I just want to feel your goodness. They go home and they call each other. Oh, how good he is. Oh, it's wonderful. And then we go do it again. And then we go do it again. And we go do it again. Oh, my. Man, I fell out 17 times the other night. It was wonderful. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. And it is good to be in his presence. Don't misunderstand me. You're looking at a man that loves to just waller in the very presence of God. But we must have eyes to see. We must be alert as soldiers on the army of God saying, Lord, no matter how much I feel your presence, I won't go to sleep and pretend like there's no enemy out there. But I'll look around at the 
watchman on the wall. I'll be like you called the disciples to be. To watch and pray. To watch and enjoy. To watch and enjoy your presence. I don't want to be a layer. I want to be a leper. I want to be one that says, God, cover me. Feel me. Thrill me. There's no greater feeling if you've never been there. If you've never been in his presence, that way. I remember one time, the old building was about right back there about where Sister Shirley is and Sister Tammy, remember, I fell up against the wall just like someone threw me up against the wall. Bam! I'm just sitting there and I'm weeping from head to toe. I mean, just my whole body is just shaking. And then as I go down the wall, it changed from weeping to laughter and to joy. I'm thinking, God, this is crazy stuff. I mean, when you laugh so much, you can't stop it. You say, God, I feel so good. And your tears are tears, not of sorrow, but of thanksgiving and joy. How many ever watched a video or saw something happen and a joy tear came out? Anybody? How about a flood of joy tears? Where you just flooded so much you can't even stop them. But it's not because you're sad. It's because you're so happy. One time I was so happy in the Lord. He kept just pouring it over me. I'm crying. I'm weeping. I'm, oh, my God, you feel so good. I said, Lord, stop. I don't want no more. Give something to my brother over in Arizona. Literally, that was a prayer. I couldn't take it anymore. It was so good. I love to be in his presence. I know some of you are going to think I'm crazy with this, and it's all right, because I may be. I said this a thousand times before. I lost my mind a long time ago. I didn't want it back. But I'm in the building in there praying by myself one day. Sister Mary, you're going to get a kick out of this. I know. I just know you enough to say she's going to love this. I'm just, I'm just in, in the presence of the Lord, and I said, oh, God, I love you so much. So I just reached over and laid hands on myself. <laughs> Bam! I went out in the spirit. I fell on the floor. Nobody's there to catch me. Nobody's around. I laid there on the ground. I said, man, this is weird. <laughs> Who lays their hand on their own floor? It'll fall down. It's crazy. So I got up, and I'm worshiping, and I did it again. Bam! I fell out. I said, God, this is nuts. I did it a third time. I said, God, if someone looked in this room, they'd think I was absolutely psychotic. But his presence was so around me. I tried it again. Bam! Reach it a fifth time. I said, bam, I'm on the ground. I said, after that, I'm not doing it no more. This is crazy, God. <laughs> this is lunatic stuff. This is psychotic. No, this is his love that he was so around me. I couldn't handle it. I have been in his presence. I'm going to tell you, I would love every day to just roll around in his glory and enjoy him overshadowing me. But I cannot lay in the presence of his spirit. Some people are laying in the word, the washing of the word, the water of the word. They're just laying in it and just gobbling. Just, oh, flood me, Lord, some more. And God is saying, there's plenty. But get up and watch. Come on, me. Get up and watch. Because I didn't call you just to walk in my glory. There's a place called the New Jerusalem. We call it heaven and then heaven descending. Whatever you want to label it as. We're going to forever be with him one day. And guess what? You can just waller in his, I don't know why I'm saying the word waller. My wife's going to get on me later on. You can just get in his glory and roll around all day long and just, oh my, and it'll never stop. And you don't have to worry about battling. You don't have to worry about the devil. You don't have to worry about, just enjoy his presence all the time. But right now, enjoy the glory, but watch. But watch. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Watch. Because the enemy as a roaring lion Walks about seeking who he may devour. There's a real enemy out there. And I'm going to say this. You want to go against the devil? I'd rather go against him after I've been rolling in the glory. A whole lot more than any other time in my life. 
I mean, when you roll in the glory of God, you come out, you smell like Jesus, you look like Jesus, you act like Jesus, you walk like Jesus, you got a faith around you like Jesus. There's something about Jesus in you. I think it was uh, uh, the funny preacher, what's his name in New Orleans? Jesse Duplantis or one of them was saying that, that the guys are going to eat or something. I, I may have the story mixed up if I do this. Just go along pretend like it's right. But he was with the guys and, and uh, uh, they were out eating the ministers and they were going to go out to eat or something. And the Lord said, I want you to go pray. And he went up to his motel room and he rolled in the glory, basically. He stayed in the presence of God. Listen to me. There's something about the presence of God. When he got to the church that night to speak, he was late. <coughs> And when he walked in the door, every eye was on him. And as he walked around the corner, see, the people recognize the glory of the Lord. The devil recognizes the glory of the Lord. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Roll in the glory, but keep a watchful eye. And realize God has called you to be one covered in his glory, but to walk as a warrior of great victory and authority and power. Drink the word. Drink the word. Drink the word. As Susan and then went over there, let him hug you. Let him embrace you. Let him cover you. And then get up and watch. See, if God hugs me, all that should tell me is I am God's child. Devil, get out of my way. And that can't just be some empty words that we're trying to say. Devil, I rebuke you. I'm telling you, somewhere you've got to have enough faith to believe what you're saying is what you're saying and walk on through him. Many people have been in delivered services and people screaming and yelling and speaking in tongues and going crazy, commanding and binding and loosening, and voices are shouting out the other person and they're kicking and screaming and won't do anything. And then one person might walk over and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, it's done. Amen. And bam. My brother-in-law said one time, you, you, you can say what you want on this, but when we are ambassadors of God and God tells us what to say, then we can walk and say, guess what? I'm a shadow of my daddy. They're trying to cast devils out of, of someone one time, and I think the story kind of went like this. I mean, they're having a, a time with this demonic possessed people person. They're, they're holding them down, they're praying, and he walks over and says, don't you know who this is? This is God. Get out. That's over. Why? Because the authority and the power and the glory of the Lord was about him. It wasn't about just laying in it and not becoming strong by the word of God. It was one that would say, I'll drink up and I'll drink up and I'll drink up. I'll drink the word of God. I'll drink his presence. I'll be saturated in him. But I will stand as a watchman with power and authority. Listen to me, O oh man of God. You're called to watch over your home. Come on. I'll be done in nine minutes, I promise. Man of God, you say, well, I'm not that strong of a Christian. It's my wife's job. No, it's not. It's your job, man of God. Rise up. Take authority over your home. Be the watchman on the wall. Be the covering of that house the way God designed you to be. And when you do your part, guess what? God will launch your wife into her part in a greater, stronger way. She seems to have to sometimes fight the battle alone. Listen to me. It's not your wife's battle to fight for the family on her knees just because she might be an intercessor or a prayer warrior. Oh, man of God, it is on your shoulders by the word of God that you're to cover and pray with her. Yeah. Stand in authority. Rise in authority. Stand with your wife. Stand and believe. Take authority. The enemy comes into some of our homes. He's beating things to pieces. I'm going to tell you, oh, I didn't mean to get on this, but it's a nice little soapbox for a minute. Let's just stay there. Seven minutes left. Okay. We're fearful for what's going on in our families, our finances, our circumstances, our world. But when a man and a woman will determine in their heart, we will pray together. We'll be as one voice. We'll unite as a team, as one, as a family. We're going to cry out to our God and declare over our family. I'm going to tell you there's something about the power of unity that is unshakable, unmovable. When you guys pray together, hell cannot stand because you have stepped into that which God has ordained. And if God has ordained it, the enemy can't stand against it. God wants you to rise up for warriors. At a young age, I was taught, greater is he 
that is in me than he that's in the world. Greater is he that, that he that is in me than he that's in the world. No weapon formed against you can prosper. Every tongue that rises against you, you self-condemn. You have that ability. That's the heritage of the saints of God. You're more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. You hear that all the time. That's who we are. Let's stop just talking about it. Let's stop just laying on the ground and say, you know, just laughing, you know, just, just scraping the, the water. I'm laying down. Let's stop being that layer and become that leper that says, God, I will rise up in power and authority and declare your word in my life. Powerful. Those are the people that are making a change in our world. Those are the people that are making a change in their world. And those are the people that are called to be us. You. That's you. That's me. There's something great inside of you. When you look in the mirror and you make a decision, I don't feel like I'm anything. God looks in the mirror and says, you are a mighty man, a mighty woman of that. Today, let's make that decision. Let's not just drink of what he has for us, but let's keep our eyes open and say, God, I'll stay alert. And oh, by the way, when we're alert like that, the battle they had to go through was not hard at all. Do you hear me? The battle was not hard at all. All their job was to do was break a lantern and shout the sword of the Lord and Gideon and blow a little trumpet and that was it. That was it. Some of us, we go the hard way. Man, we're sweating bullets. Oh God, we're dragging everything behind us. I'm going to make it through, God. Thank God you're stubborn, you know. I'm going to make it through, God. I'm pushing through this. And God's saying, that's not the way I designed you to go through this thing. Are you hearing me? He's for you, not Come on, stand your feet. Hallelujah. Jesus.